Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's wonderful to be in the house of God this morning time. Amen. Amen. God has given another day so that we can come together as brothers and sisters and rejoice in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to give you much introduction of myself because I'm not new here, but I just want to say thank you to the pastors, the elders, the deacons who have entrusted me to preach the word this morning time, and uh, may God's name be glorified this morning. For today's passage, I'm going to be reading from Jude 1 verses 11. Jude 1 verses 11, I'm reading. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, have plunged into Balaam's error for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion. Let's close our eyes and pray. God, I thank you for this word that you have presented before us, Lord. Whatever you intend to do with each one of our hearts, including myself, I pray, Lord, that it shall come to pass. Bless and change the listener and the speaker alike. In the name of Jesus Christ, we plead. Amen. 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 On January 28, uh, 1986, there's a man named Bob Ebling who told uh, the NASA, um, air, um, a NASA astronauts and uh, the people who were in charge of the Challenger space shuttle to delay the launching of their, of their space shuttle called Challenger, uh, Challenger Space Shuttle. The reason why he sounded the alarm was uh, the night before the launch, the weather went sub, uh, like below zero degrees. So he had a concern in his mind that, oh, wait, the O-rings that separate the main body of the rockets from the booster might not function properly and may cause the um, aircraft to explode. He went and told his authorities and his officials, and they said, do not bring that concern now. We cannot delay the launching. It has to happen today. So Bob Eveling went back home, very upset, very sad, not wanting to see what's going to happen if in cases were supposed to explode. On the morning of 19, of, on the morning of 1986, January 28th, while millions of people were watching their TV from Florida and all throughout the world, the Challenger space shuttle exploded within 73 seconds into flights. It was one of the disaster moments of history. And when they did uh, the investigation, they did find out actually there was ice crystals around the O-ring of that entire space shuttle which likely caused the entire explosion of that. On that day, seven astro astronauts were killed because a, a warning was not valued into. Why am I telling you the story this morning time? The Bible is filled with a lot of promises, prophecies, and warnings. And as believers and as non-believers, we have to pay attention to the warnings that has been presented in the Bible in order to make sure that you make it onto the other side, which is eternity. Amen? So Jude rings an alarm to the church or the early believers in that day uh, regarding apostates or false prophets that come in to the church and corrupt it. I'm not going to go much detail into that because uh, Dr. Minu did a fantastic job last week explaining from the book of Jude. And that's, again, the confirmation I received. This is truly from the Lord. So Jude, who is a brother of Jesus and a brother of James, decides to write a warning letter to the early Christians who were filled with apostates. So what is his me message? He's saying, be careful or woe to those who have gone to the way of Cain, the error of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah. These are three examples of people who, who had thoughts and ways above God's desires and prescription for life. These three individuals had hate, greed, and arrogance. So let's study about them one by one. The first guy or the first person is Cain. His story can be found in Genesis 4, and he was the first son of Adam. He was a farmer. He was Abel's brother, and he's also the first murderer in the Bible. So the, off, the story begins in the Garden of Eden when both of them decides to do, uh, perform an offering or give an offering to the Lord. Nowhere in the Bible do we find that God told each one of them, hey, you have to give me an offering. No, but it, it appears that both of them voluntarily went and offered a sacrifice. So Genesis 4, 3, it says, in the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. It means they did a free will offering. They went ahead and did an offering. And it's in this story that the Bible warns, 
Do not go in the way of Cain. So what are those? Let's study. The first one, Cain had an angry and hateful heart. Genesis 4 verses 5. Cain was very angry and his face fell. The anger led to, to have evil in his heart, which made him commit an evil deed. So the beginning of all that problem was from hatred. Now, why was he upset? He was upset because the Lord was not favorable upon his offering, but was favorable upon Abel's. What we need to study from this is do not come into the Lord's presence with a hateful heart against your brothers and sisters to commit an offering because it is invalid. Go and reconcile before you come and into the presence of God because it may end up in murder. When I say murder, I'm not talking about physical murder. We are very good and we live in a cancel culture these days. We live in a, in a world where we can block people off and block numbers due to hatred. So the point this morning time is Cain had a very hateful and very evil heart, an angry heart within himself. So that's the first way the Bible warns us against, do not come with a hateful or an angry heart. Matthew 5, 23, 24, we all know this. If you have an offering and you remember that somebody has wronged you, leave it and go and reconcile before coming to the presence of God. I know that we have heard these messages or these verses when we talk about the Holy Communion. But Holy Communion is not the only time that we should think about this. Any time, even whether it be your household, say you had a fight with your spouse, say you had a fight with your children, you need to reconcile and sort things out before you call upon the name of Yahweh. That is the text, that is the word that God demands us. Because that's exactly what Cain did. He was hateful to begin with. And how do we know that? See, the Bible says that if, if, if one of our brothers, if my sister, say, got something so much better in life, wouldn't I be naturally happy about him and how he has done better in life? Similarly, if I really hated her to begin with, because maybe there's some kind of rivalry in the house, there's probably an order of picking of who always gets favored, like Jacob and Esau, you see how somebody always gets favored. Maybe a hatred has already begun there. And that's why I believe that Cain and Abel must not have had the best relationship because how or what does it take to kill your own brother when the God of heavens was pleased on one of their offering? The point that I'm making is do not come give an offering when you have a hatred or dislike to your own brothers and sisters. The number two, the way of Cain, what is it? Evil deed. First John 3 verses 12. Cain is so fam famous, even in the New Testament, the apostles are calling him out and warning the church to avoid his behavior. So the number two way of uh, Cain is evil deed. Unlike Cain, who was of evil, one murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. This morning time, examine yourself. Is your deeds evil or is it good in the presence of God? Because when you're coming to worship, when you are offering your sacrifice, if you commit evil deeds all the time, the Lord is calling out to you. The word of God says, woe to you. Do not walk in the way of Cain. Amen. God sees every single aspect of your life. Cain must have thought the evil deed that he did could be hidden. But little did he know the God that created him has seen everything and, and already has seen what he's about to do. Number three, we understand what is the way of Cain. It's unfaithful heart. Hebrews 11 verses 4. This is something that we know. Ab he believed, Abel believed that the offering that he was about to give will be accepted by the Lord. That he was going to be received by the Lord and that he did it with wholeheartedly. Versus Cain he must have just done it because for the sake of it. Because if you read the text, it says, Cain picked some f produce off the land versus Abel, the, the firstborn, plus the fat. There was intention behind his worship. There was intention behind why he came to the Lord that day. This morning time, I want you to remind yourself, whenever you call upon the name of the Lord, whenever you come together as a church gathering, what is your intention? What do you mean to gain I don't know what Cain's heart was, but definitely it might not have been to please the Lord. He must have just done it just like myself. I have caught coming to church just to say I went to church. He just did an offering. But Abel did the best. What I want to point this morning time is always offer God your praises and worship in a faithful manner. In the manner knowing that the Lord will hear you and the Lord will receive your offering. 
the last thing about Cain, the way of Cain, he had a stubborn heart. You see, God multiple told him, told Cain, Cain, you better watch out. Satan's right at the door and he's going to make you do something that you don't want to do. So do not do it. Cain ignored the warnings from above. Don't brush off the convictions that you receive in your life, whether it be through your pastors, through your messages, through your parents, through the Holy Spirit, because it will end you up in an evil deed and the, and the mistake might be too late. Amen. For most of us, we sometimes know what we are doing is kind of wrong. We kind of have that inclination and yet we brush it off like Cain. The Bible says, woe to you, because eventually you'll end up doing that evil deed. And what happened to Cain? He was cast away from the presence of God. Praise God. So the second uh, person we're talking about is Balaam. The Bible talks about the way of Cain and the error of Balaam. So what was Balaam's error? Balaam was a son of uh, Beor or Bozor. He was a prophet. Un unknown if he was a pagan prophet or if he was actually a Jewish prophet. Uh, there are arguments about it. But one thing is for sure. This guy definitely heard from the Lord. When he asked something of the Lord, he heard it. Okay, whether it be pagan or not pagan. Now, the story occurs in Numbers 22. And the background is no, we all know it. It's Mr. The King Balak wanted Balaam to go and uh, outpour a curse on Israel people and Balaam tried it over and over and over again and the Lord says my man don't do it don't do it I am not with you do not curse those people they are my people that's what the Lord told Balaam so Balaam like a goody two shoe like most of us listened to that went back and told Balaam that hey I can't do it the Lord said it's, it's not going to happen but Balak kept on enticing him kept on saying go and ask more go and ask again I will give you more and more and more and riches even though Balaam knows the answer, even though Balaam know what the will of God is, he kept on asking God for the will to be changed in a manner. Why? Because his heart was greedy. His heart was set on that, on that money and the position and the throne that Balak was giving an offering to him. Balaam, for a temporary moment, forgot who God was and looked after the temporary flesh, a fleshly desire that is offered by Balak. Amen? Just like how... Esau and Jacob. Jacob was so hungry. Esau was so hungry that he temporarily forgot what his goodness was and he gave his birthright. Similarly, this guy, Balaam, he had an error. And what is the number one error? It is greedy for self-satisfaction. 2 Peter 2 verses 15. They have gone astray by abandoning the straight path and followed the error of Balaam. Like Balaam in each one of our lives, we want to do certain things. And we do know that it is wrong. We do know that the Spirit of God has warned us against it. We know the Scripture does not align with what we're about to do. And yet, what do we do? We ask for God's will. For many of us, we cannot take no for an answer in life. Remember, dear children of God, even a no from God is an answer to your prayers. Do not always expect for yes, go ahead. Yes, do that. Even a no, even a silence, even a rejection is an answer from God. The more you push it, the more you push it. You know what God did to Balaam? Go ahead. You know why God said go ahead? It's not like he changed his mind. It's because he wanted to show at the end of the day who was still in control, even when Balaam pretended or thought he could change God's mind or in, in, imply his own will. The God that you and I serve is not foolish. Just because you think that you have maybe heard from the word of God, maybe you have been inclined and you prayed so many days and you got that pseudo confirmation is from God. Be very careful. Do not make the error of Balaam where you think God must have told you, but in reality it wasn't. Personally, I've had personally couple friends who actually got married to people who did not know God. We we're talking about atheists. And the original intention was the Lord gave me a confirmation that she was the one. Why? Because, because the Lord said so. And, you know, I can convert her. I can change her. And my friends, unfortunately, they too have become a, a, a atheists and have gone in the era of Balaam. The point that I'm trying to say this morning time is... Do not try to push and push and push and try to uh, do the alternate will of God. There's no such thing as alternate will of God. But still, you know, there is something called the perfect will. And that is what we need to be seeking after. That's what we as Christians need to be after God's heart. So remember, dear children of God, when God says no for certain things, when God closes a door for a certain thing, take that as an answer. Stop pushing and pushing and pushing until your heart's desire gets fulfilled. That's what Balaam did. Number two. Number two, Balaam was a stumbling block 
This was quite interesting to me. Numbers 31 verses 16. Yet they are the ones who at Balaam's advice incited the Israelites against the Lord. So that uh, against the Lord. Revelation 2 verses 14 talks about this incident. You hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of Israel to eat meat, sacrifice, and to commit sexual immorality. I don't have much time with, in front of me, but what I'm going to tell you right now is do not be a stumbling block for, to certain people. These days we live in the grace and in the liberty of Christian freedom. But unfortunately, we have abused it so much to the point that people around us don't even want to be Christians because why? We have become the stumbling block. The liberty that Christ has given us has been abused to the nth degree to a point where the next person don't even want to come to Christ anymore. 1 Corinthians 8 verses 9. Be careful the right of yours in no becomes a stumbling block to the weak. I want you to remember that. I know you have Christian freedom. 1 Corinthians 8 9. They were talking about eating meat or, uh, and, and how certain people could and could not. In today's modern society, this would be the conversation of alcohol, going to work parties, uh, socializing with people of, that you should not be socializing with, going to parties or rallies or doing things that may stumble other people. You may have the liberty, but do not engage that to a point where it becomes a stumbling block to other people. We as Christians are called to snatch people from fire. We are not called to be people of stumbling block. Remember in Jude, in that same verse, Jude 23, 1 verse 23 says, Snay, save others by snatching them from the fire. That is the call of the Christian this morning, not to be a stumbling block just like Balaam did. The last person that I'm going to talk about is Korah. He's a son of Izar, a Levite and a Kohatite. Amen. The story is basically in, in, in Israel um, how Korah and a group of his 250 men and other people decide to say, enough is enough. We don't want your leadership anymore. We too can be leaders. So the Bible calls it, woe to the rebellion of Korah. What did Korah have? He was arrogant, he was defiant, and he was disrespectful. He questioned the very God that placed people that were over in charge of him. For many of us, we might be upset at the pastors, the parents, uh, the teachers, the rulers, the things that God has placed over us. But the Bible teaches us this morning, you cannot be disrespectful. You cannot be arrogant or defiant at the institutions God has placed in each one of your lives. That respect your pastors, respect the elders, respect the people, the, the parents that God has placed in charge of you. The Bible says, woe to the rebellion of Korah. The... The, the reminder here to each, every single believer this morning time is watch the sins of rebellion. I don't have touch, time to explain it, but let me tell you, watch the sins of rebellion. Don't become defiled by rebellious people. Don't be defined by disrespectful people. Don't be disrespectful. When this all happens, when you have a, when you have a defined heart, you become ignorant and watch the spirit of ignorance. And at that moment, you need to guard your mouth and guard your mind. What, Cor what Korah did not realize was everything that he uttered out of his mind in ignorance and disrespectfulness, the Lord Almighty heard. Anytime when you have a conversation with your friend, when you are rebellious, remember there's a person called God listening to the conversations. Number two, what is the rebellion of Korah? He was not happy where God has placed him in his life. What do I mean by that? Korah was the grandson of a person named Kohat. And Kohat had this job, or they were Kohatites. Their job was to take the articles from the church back and forth, uh, the tabernacle, uh, you know, moving this podium, moving the cups, moving the tables, moving the ark. The Kohatites did that job. But he was not happy at that. He realized, man, I could do better. I could be a leader. I could be a preacher. I could do this. I could do that. So what did, that's the entire uh, beginning of that um, uh, rebellion. What I want to remind you this morning time, the Bible warns, be careful of the rebellion of Korah. Do not become something simply because, you know, somebody told you to do so. Do not try to usurp the position or the power and thinking that, man, I could have done so much better than him. The Lord watches such a heart. Be humble, be noble, be respectful, and be faithful in what, whatever position in church you have, whatever position the Lord has placed you, and he will lift you up in the due time as long as you are faithful. Do not be rebellious like Korah. What I want to remind you this morning time and leave you with is that God's mercy 
still exists for each one of us, even though we may have, including myself, has gone into the ways of Cain, into the, uh, into the uh, era of Balaam, into the, in the, the rebellion of Korah, the Lord is still merciful. Why do I say that? Because even though Korah was swallowed up by the earth, his children were spared. Dear children, you may see things in your life that your parents, that your relatives, that your elders must have done something wrong. You don't, you don't have to follow that same pathway. You don't have to be rebellious. You don't have to create factions. All you need to do is submit it under the Lord's authority hands. And this morning time, we serve a God who is merciful, who is standing with arms open wide to forgive each one of our sins myself included I have gone astray in the ways of Cain Korah and Balaam so this morning time let us submit and surrender our hearts so we don't follow in those ways we are called to be a light and shining example to the world about Jesus Christ may God's grace and blessings be upon you amen